on Sponso, who will be speaking in opposition uh, as, a, as the victim. Uh, at the very end, you'll be allowed to make a statement if you'd like to before we reach a decision. Okay, you ready? All right. All right. Um, Mr. Pronounce your name again. Demetri Deborah. Deborah. Mr. Deborah. Your, uh, your DOC number is 340678. You're classified as a third felony offender. You're sentenced uh, 1999 for attempted second degree murder in Abbe Parish. You received a 40 year sentence. Uh, also, December 1999, as a habitual offender or robbery, you received a 60 year sentence. Those are running concurrently. Uh, and then consecutive to that, Sent those sentences in Cabo, February of 2000, simple criminal damage to property. You received a sentence of a total of 62 years. Parole eligibility is August 1st, 2021. Good time, May 16, 2058. Full term is December 2nd, 2059. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. So, how old are you, sir, Mr. De DeBrow? 47. 47. How long have you been in jail? 25. 25 years. Five years of a 62-year sentence. So um, I've read the information that was provided to us about the, uh, the facts of the case. So as far as the offense goes, the uh, armed robbery and attempted murder, what were you looking for in the victim's apartment? You have you have two code defenders, right? Yes. What are we all looking for? Drugs and money. All right. And then after you were, you know, all three tried together, or, or trials were held simultaneously for all three of you, all were found guilty. While you were awaiting sentencing, I noticed that there was a violent encounter in the jail. Right? Right. Yes, ma'am. That was the uh, simple criminal damage to property, which was, it was a little more involved than that, I believe. Yes, ma'am. So what was going on with you then? Just At stress. Just stress. stress. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever been on supervision before? No, ma'am. Supervision parole? Probation or parole supervision? Yes, yes ma'am. Parole. Yes, ma'am. Ma How did you do on supervision? I did. I did good. You were never revoked. Yes, ma'am. So I called the charge. So you were revoked. Charge. Ma'am. Your probation, your parole or probation was revoked because of these new charges. Yes, ma'am. Looks to me like you were arrested within a month of getting out on good time. Yes, ma'am. So that's not doing very well on supervision. Look, I want to just talk about you have a lot of opposition that's been expressed. We'll hear from the victim in just a few moments. You have law enforcement opposition. You have a poor conduct record. You have 138 write ups, uh, you know, and, and you just haven't been doing very well following the rules of the prison. Uh, it looks to me like you, you did take uh, some anger management class in 2019, but you have in April of 21, in March of 2021, you have a fighting, aggravated disobedience, defiance, another aggravated disobedience. After the anger management, so what's going on? You're having a hard time still? After all, 45 years, you're having a hard time adjusting to prison? No, ma'am. Why you can't follow the rules? Why you can't control your temper? I don't know. Can't answer that? You didn't learn anything in that uh, anger management class? Well, I, I feel like I did a little better. I only got three write-ups, three or four write-ups since then. You, got, you had four write-ups in 2021. You had seven in 2020. So I guess you could say you might be getting a little better since you only had four last year, but they're serious. Yes, ma'am. 
They're all high court write-ups. Yes, ma'am. What other programs have you taken uh, since you've been in jail? I understand what you said. What other programs have you been able to complete since you've been in jail? No. Why is that? I've been caught up in the cells, caught up on lockdown. And they don't have any any uh any programs in lockdown? No ma'am. You didn't ask for any. Dang are you God. in lockdown now? You're in maximum custody. Are you in a lockdown situation now? Yes, ma'am. I was on lockdown at the time. Where do you live now? Oh, I live in Camp D population. You so say when did you get into general population? About two months ago. Well, here we go again. You, it, you're not so. According to our policies, a person who's been in a lockdown situation is not eligible to be considered for parole till they've been successful and out of lockdown for a period of at least six months. So today, you don't quite meet that criteria. That's Since nice. you've been out for the last two months, have you asked to sign up for any programs? I signed up for some. What? Oh, uh, the hundred hours and thinking of a change. Good. Well, those are good programs. I would encourage you to also ask to retake that uh, anger management class. So I can't vote for you today because you don't meet our criteria, but I'm going to ask um, uh, Mr. Sponsor, John Sponsor, who is here today and is asked to speak. I'd like to do what he has to say. Good morning, and good afternoon, and thanks for letting me be here. So, so I guess you heard those remarks that uh, actually Mr. Brown is not eligible for all consideration at this time, but I will do what you have to say. I could not hear what you had just said. We, the conversation I just had with Mr. DeBrow, he's not eligible for parole consideration. But since you've waited all day to tell us what you want to say, we want to hear from you. First of all, I know Mr. DeBro has never heard this from somebody, but I forgive him for what he's done to me. I can't regret what he's done since then. I got a lot of things I want to say, but I don't know if you guys could really understand what I go through, what my days are really like. It's a struggle for me to get out there in society's eyes and say good afternoon to somebody or say, anything. I don't trust no one. I forgive him for what he done, but I will never forget January 27th. No, January 28th, 1997. I remember looking at all three of them in the face, but I'll never forget his because I have to dream about it. There's not a day that doesn't go by that I, I don't fear from looking behind. I have my own house. I have my own friends. I still don't trust nobody. How I feel I'm going to have to live with the rest of my life. Could he really handle living the rest of his life there? For something he had a choice and a decision to make? The stuff that he got from me, did he enjoy it while he had it? These are the questions I have and I've wanted, always wanted to ask. It's, I thank you guys for 
I can't hate the man. I can only forgive him. It's in society's eyes for them to forgive or not hate him. But as long as he has the attitude that he has, he'll never get nowhere. From the day I, re I had to do my interview again when I went to court, his attitude and look has never changed. I thank y'all for letting me say what I got to say, but on a lot of things, I'm holding my tongue. Yes, sir. And we, we do appreciate that. And we appreciate um, your participation today. We, we did get the letter that you submitted. And so we, we have an idea of your struggles on a daily basis. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank um, today, you. Uh, I'll, I'll vote first. My vote today, Mr. DeBrow, is to deny your parole because technically you are not eligible for consideration. Mr. Roche. Um, Mr. DeBrow, my vote is the same for the same reason. Mr. Frank. And I concur. All right, Mr. Brad, you got a lot of work to do, so get to it. Uh, your parole's been denied today. Good luck to you. So thank you, Mr. Sponsor. All right, uh, Warden Ambo, I think that concludes our business at Ango. Okay. So let's unpack this. And before I start unpacking, I want to let you know that we are going to watch two more parole hearings based on this case. Now, the parole hearings are going to be for his co-defendant. He had two co-defendants in this horrific crime. And when I say horrific, there is no exaggeration to it. You can see on this man the trauma. You can see it. You can feel it. You can hear it. He articulated it. And when we read through how, how violent, how disturbing the crime was, you can get an idea of, of really what it is that he's been having to go through his entire life what he shared with us. I too want to make a rare thank you to Ms. Renata for allowing him to speak. You know, she was, he was being denied, but she still let him speak. And, you know, this was the final day of the hearing. He had been sitting there for four or five hours waiting to speak. I believe that they ask all participants to join pretty much right away because again, they don't know necessarily when the opportunity to speak will be because the prior hearings might take 20 minutes. They might take an hour, right? So you can, you never know. Um, so I appreciate that they let, they let her do that. What I don't appreciate is the idea that this person wasn't qualified for parole. He literally just got out of segregation. He's only been in population for a few months. He's been on lockdown. And as Mr. Knotts has said, Oh, so we're going through the cycle again. And, you know, we, we have seen them progress. This hearing took place in 2022. And we have seen later on that they now don't even allow hearings if you've had one write-up. You could have been in population for 10 straight years, not had a write-up. But if you had one write-up that year, they don't want, they won't have your parole hearing. So we have seen how they've progressed. But still... The idea that the victim was going to have to go through all the emotional stress for a hearing that should have never happened is it's not cool. Um, so we'll jump in and then we'll go into the next two hearings, which I haven't seen yet. Uh, Richard only pieced them together on the spreadsheet. So I'll be going through this with you in real time. Now, John Sponsor lived on Greenway and he's, he's the survivor, right? Um, in Shreveport at 9.30 at night on January 28th, 1997, as John had said, a night he will never forget, Sponsel heard a knock on his apartment door. Unable to see anyone through the door's people, Sponsel opened the door, which is, he opened the door to hell. He opened the door to never being able to open a door to a stranger again. And, uh, that's scary, right? Standing in his door doorway were three black males later identified by Sponsel as 
Jamitric, Lakeith, and Clifford. A black 25 caliber hanging was immediately placed to Sponsel's head by one defendant, and the trigger was pulled. But the gun didn't fire. The other defendants were armed with Western style 22 pistols, you know, those cow cowboy looking revolvers. All three, oh my gosh, there's a lot more. I'll go through. No. Come on, lawnmower. All three wore tube socks on their hands. Now think about this idea. Now I'm going to pause and wait. Okay, I think we're good. So think about this. They're wearing tube socks on their hands. They're not wearing masks. They're not wearing tube socks on their face. It's on their hands. And I don't know if he picked up on that, but reading it, you can tell that they only cared about their fingerprints being left behind, not a witness being able to identify them. So I think their intent is is clear right here. Um, so Dimitric uh, uh, and Clifford entered Sponsel's apartment and ordered him to lie face down on the kitchen floor. They asked where his money and narcotics were. One defendant stood guard over Sponsel in the kitchen while the others removed his possessions from the apartment. Among the item taken were a VCR, jacket, faceplate to a car stereo, meat from the freezer, and $400 cash. That's all to split between three guys. Great, great score. Great score. Really worth a man's life. The defendant... The defendants were in Sponsel's apartment for 15 to 20 minutes when Sponsel heard one of the defendants make a statement indicating he was going to be killed. Sponsel tried to escape. Now, listen to this. And, you know, he, he, he looked like a big guy from the YouTube, but he was a big guy. Sponsel, who played center for several local semi-pro football teams, did what any professional football player might do in this situation. He jumped up and he rushed the defendants who were guarding him. He pushed his defendants. He pushed this defendant to the side and ran towards the door towards freedom. But as he reached the front door of the apartment, he was shot in the back twice. Sponsel fell on the door's threshold due to his wounds. As the defendants exited the apartment, he was shot once in the head. Yes, you heard that right. But how he lived, how he survived that. I mean, he had angels watching him that day. I remember when they first walked in, they pulled the trigger without even speaking a word. Sponsor was unable to identify at trial who the defendants, which defendant fired the shots. The defendants fled the apartment complex and his blue four escort having taken the keys from his apartment um so i think what we're going to do is we are going to watch the next parole hearing and then we'll go over more of this information and then we'll watch the final parole hearing and the parole hearings with his co-defendants um but i think that Instead of going through all this information now, which is how they identified him, how they caught them, um, I think you know I could be wrong. I don't know which is the best way to do it, but this is what we're going to do. We're going to jump to the next parole hearing, and you can let me know in the comments how you would have preferred I uh, proceeded. But again, I haven't seen the other parole hearings yet, so I'll be going through this um, journey with you. So it actually goes back um, in the past a few months to, to about six months before this hearing, and it's for his co-defendant. Um, so with that, let's jump in. Where's the image? Oh. I'm still believing. It always feels good to see oh. Miss Jackson pop up on the screen. There's our survivor, the linebacker. Good thing 
Wilbur. Well, the offensive linemen, I'm sorry. For those of you, most of you, I'm sure know, but the offensive lineman is the man who sits at the front and hands the quarterback the ball. He's like the, the center, the pillar of the offensive line to protect the quarterback. They say he's also tend to be the, the most intelligent uh, player on the offensive line. Would the offender yes, no. please introduce yourself for the record, stating your name and DOC number? My name is Clifford Owens, 3345-27. Thank you. Let me explain the process to you. First, I will read information into the record, then the board will conduct a thorough interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow the participants who have indicated to speak to have their input. We have two who are here in support and both will be speaking. We have Ms. Chiquita Thompson, fiance, and Mr. Andrew Hunley from Louisiana Pro Project. And we also have one in opposition, Mr. John Sponsel, victim, who will be speaking. At the end, Mr. Owens, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand the process, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is the case for Clifford Owens, DOC number 334-527, date of birth, August 12, 1975, classified as a second felony offender, offenses, armed robbery, attempted second degree murder, sentencing date, December 16, 1999, sentenced to a total of 60 years, parole date, August 1st, 2021, good time, not eligible, full term, February 8th, 2057. Is this information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Renato. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Owens. Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Renato. Your case has been assigned to me, so I'll start out with uh, asking you some questions, okay? Yes, ma'am. So, Mr. Owens, um, I reviewed the information provided to us by uh, Angola and the uh, DOC. Uh, I see that you're, are you 46? Yes, ma'am. How many years you've been in jail? 25, ma'am. Over half your life? Ma'am. You ever thought about it that way? Yes, ma'am, I thought about it. I thought about my actions, yes, ma'am. Well, what, what I meant was, have you ever thought about looking in retrospect, you've been in jail over half your life? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, okay. I have. And so you're a second offender, and your prior uh, criminal history includes includes a, a illegal use of weapons. You got a two-year sentence uh, and probation, and that was revoked because of this offense? Yes, ma'am. That's right? Correct. Okay. And so, and we'll hear from Mr. Sponsor shortly, but uh, he's still affected by what happened Uh during the commission of this crime. He was actually shot, I believe, in the head and the back. You didn't shoot him in the head, but the record indicates that you shot him while he was trying to escape in the back twice. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So tell me, um, Mr. Owens, what caused you to be in this situation? Well, I didn't have no guidance. I didn't have no job. Um, I just, my life was a mess. I didn't have no, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't doing no thinking on the street. I mean, I ain't had no business doing what I'd done to Mr. Sponsor. I had no business doing that, and that was wrong. Right. Well, I, well, that's a given. So you were 22 at the time? Yes, ma'am. What level did you uh, complete in school? Ninth grade, ma'am. Why'd you quit school? Well, I had a learning disability. It was hard for me to learn and then grasp for what, what to keep what I learned, I couldn't, it was hard for me. I had a learning disability coming up. Right, so what did you do instead of go to school? You just started running the street? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, I did, I dropped out. I started running the street. You had two co-defendants? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, I did. What happened to them? Well, they were found guilty with me and sentenced to um, the Department of Correction also. One of them had got 60 years, another had got life, life in 60 years. Okay. So since you've been in jail 23 years, tell us what you've been doing. Well, I've been taking self-help programs, anger management, um, substance abuse, thinking for a change, 100-hour pre-release, um, faith-based, Malachi dads, inside-outside dads. Um, I have been um, obtained my trustee status. Um, 
So, so let's go back to the program. So you, you were able to take those programs that you mentioned, and I think that was Living in Balance, which is a substance abuse program, Thinking for Change, the 100 Hours, and Anger Management. Um, I have Living in Balance listed twice, so I don't know if you took it once or twice. But, but so what was, it, and you were able to complete these programs in spite of your problem, your learning issues? Yes, ma'am. So which one of those programs that I just mentioned uh, meant the most to you and why? Um, thank you for a change. What did that, what did you get out of that program? Knowing your consequences, um, knowing the consequences when you think before you um, do something wrong and know your consequences. Mm -hmm. So what about, um, I look at your, your write-ups, you have 20, 23 write-ups. I see the last was in 2020, which was for fighting. Uh, the one prior to that looks like it was in 2017 for fighting. So when I, as I look at all of the, the write-ups, almost half of them are for fighting. Explain that to me. Well, ma'am, um, I have, you know, put myself in situations and guys up here, I mean, you know, I had a, a problem with backing down. And dudes to try you up here and, and um always put myself in, you know, I kind of like I had to I had to discipline myself for, for some of the fights that I had. I mean, what I mean by that, I I ended up losing. I mean, I ended up getting sale block for, for, for those fights. And I had to learn from my mistakes, make me a better person. I mean, so, you know. So when did you complete thinking for change? What year? You remember? I don't remember, ma'am. I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember the date. I right off. I'm sure I have it somewhere. I was in, in uh, anger management. I don't have a date on that either. So let's talk about your work history. You 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 work now currently at the incinerator? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and you have some previous work experience with prison enterprises in the metal fab shop? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. How long have you been at the incinerator? For uh, a couple of years, like a couple of years. Well, this says about six years. Well, six years. I mean, yeah, six years now, six years. About six years employed at the incinerator as a technician. Yes, ma'am. So you're a trustee? Yes, ma'am, I am. So how long have you been a trustee? Uh, five, six years, five, six years. Well, at least six years, because you've been at the incinerator that long. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So um, we also, I, I just want to mention that we uh, reach out to your work supervisor, or Angola does for us, and the comments from your work supervisor are, exceeds expectations, quick learner and model employee. So he thinks highly of your work. Yes, ma'am. You should be proud of that. Um, classification says you're you're uh, very responsible and you meet all the expectations. So you tell us why you believe we should vote favorably today for you. Well, I'm, I'm in, I mean I'm more mature now than I was when I first came to prison. And I learned how to work for what I want and don't put myself in situations. Um, I want to go out there in the world and um, you know. Do some good things, talk to the youth about making bad choices, putting themselves in my situation that I'm in. And I, I learned my lesson from um, doing what I did. I mean, I hurt somebody and it was wrong. And I'm ready to go out there and be a productive citizen of society. Well, but, but I'm still concerned about your write-up, even though it was two years ago, for fighting, and I look at, at most of your write-ups are for fighting. So you you and you explain that by you put yourself in those situations. So I'm concerned about that sort of activity and how you're going to make better decisions. Well, ma'am, the, the last incident I had, um, me and the dude, we we were joking around. He had problems, and um, he got mad at me and he advanced towards me, and um, so the security wasn't no security in the dome. She just had left out. I mean, me and the dude got into it. And he, you know, I had to protect myself. It was a, one of the um, situations, like in my face situation. I couldn't, I couldn't turn down. I mean, I couldn't do no thinking. I felt like he was gonna hit me. 
Okay. 2017, same thing. Same such scenario. Well, no, ma'am. I mean, you know, it just, uh, I was a wild. I was a wild then. I was a wild. I went through some phases. I went through some phases. But when do you think it changed? When did it all click for you and you began to change? Well, this last one, um, I was placed in, well, I was placed in a segregation lockdown and I was in cell one. I, I, I mean, I was gassed down, not, not gassed down, but the dude in the shower, um, they was bringing in, they was gassing them down. So I suffered for uh, me being in the dungeon uh, for my own doing. I wasn't directly gassed down, but I was suffering from, 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 you know, every time they come in and shoot their gas and they go to me. Yeah, that was in 2017. Yes, ma'am. One class that I that is uh, that I don't see listed at least is victim awareness. Have you had taken that class? Well, the um the corona has shut it down. COVID has shut the class down. Yeah, but you know that's been the last two years. No, just recently I was just in that class, ma'am. I was just recently. Just okay. Recently. And then you were enrolled, but they don't offer it right now because of the virus. I was at the end of the class. I was at the end of it. I was like three classes away for finishing. Right, but you couldn't finish it because of the virus. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, it looks like, to me, it looks like I think you completed anger management in 2014 and thinking for a change in 2018. Were you asking about that, Ms. Renance? I did, yes. I couldn't find the dates. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is more about real quick. Uh, yep, I was going, Warden, would you like to make a statement? Yes, sir. Just, just to clarify, according to our records, uh, his anger management uh, was July of 2011, and then thinking for a change was March of 18. I've got Ms. Jody standing here next to me. Um, yes, one or not. So we we were in in our victim awareness class. We were at the last three weeks of the the letter accountability part, and he was in our class. And they they stopped all of our programming right now due to the pandemic. So he did only have the letter accountability the last three weeks of that class left. All right. All right, thank you. Any other comments, Warden? You have anything else to say? No, sir. It's been it's been covered with his with his work history and uh, his his write ups. All right, thank you. Sure. How are we here for Mr. Andrew Hunley now? Uh, Andrew Hunley with Louisiana Parole Project, uh, informing the board that Clifford Owens is a client of ours if he were to be granted uh, parole by this board his uh, plan would be to come to our reentry program uh, and be in it for an intermediate uh, period of time where he would uh, readjust to society and learn new skills uh, social norms financial mom uh, management technological skills uh, while he's living in one of our residences uh, and then uh, we would help work with him to find uh, employment in this area, uh, in the Baton Rouge area, and he would eventually uh, live with his fiance, but that would not be uh, an immediate uh, plan that would, would be more for, forward in the future. Uh, he has no plan to return to the area um, where this crime was committed. Uh, in, in our estimation, Clifford uh, has greatly matured. Uh, I, too, uh, got a very strong, favorable work record uh, from his supervisors, which, motive, which was part of the motivator in us uh, hiring Clifford. I do feel like uh, what will help him um, uh, readjust and reenter our society in an effective way will be the ability to find him work uh, even though he, he has spent half of his life in prison and he's not uh, the, as young as he once was, we feel like at this time he has uh, several years in front of him to uh, earn a living and have a career. Uh, so what we submit to this board is now is the sweet spot to allow him to return to the community uh, so he can begin work uh, while he has 
uh, several years of health in front of him. Our organization uh, stands beside him and will offer him all the support we do to all of our clients, uh, uh, which includes peer mentorship and connecting to volunteers in our network. And I stand by if the board has any other questions about his reentry. Thank you. Thank you. We're here for Mr. Peter. Thompson. You're on mute. Hello. Okay, we can hear you now. Go ahead and make your brief statement. Uh, I just feel that, you know, he, he's learned his lesson and he, he acknowledges what he's done wrong. And um, I know he feels bad and remorseful when what happens because we often talk about it. And he always talk about if he had a second chance, you know, at life again and how remorseful he feel in that time when he can't see what he did, you know, he just feel bad about it, you know. And if he had a chance to get out, I'll be there to support him 100%, like I've always been there to support him, you know, as far as any resources or anything I can help him participate in, even if it means me participating with him, I'm supportive of him 100%. I'll be there for him. You know, not to be a yes person, to say yes all the time, the same as I don't think things are wrong, and to continue to encourage him and love him, you know? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. We're here for Mr. John Sponsel now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sure can. Go ahead. It's hard for me to say the thing that I want to say. Cliff, I forgive you, man, for what you've done. You made me a better person. But can you do what I'd have to do or go through every day? It's hard, man, for me to get out of bed. It's hard for me to trust somebody. I stay in my house 24 seven. I have PTSD, I can't be in society. It's hard for me to cope with people. I forgive you what you did to me, but can you give me back what you took from me? Go ahead and speak to the board, Mr. Sponsor, please speak to the board. I, these are things I apologize for saying Mr. Owen's name. But it's stuff that I've always wanted to say to him. You guys don't know what I have to go through. You guys don't know how I feel. It's hard. It's rough. It took me over 20 years to learn how to walk again. Can that man give me back my 20 years that it took for me to learn how to walk? It's hard. I can't hate him. I can only love him. I don't know what else to say. Yes, sir. Thank you for your comments. Sorry, thank you for your comments. Right, Mr. Owens, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? I was wrong. I mean, I take full responsibility for my actions and I'm remorseful. I mean, that's all I forgot to say. All right, thank you. All right, is the panel prepared to vote, Ms. Renatza? Yes. Mr. Sponsel, thank you for uh, joining us today. I know this was not an easy thing for you to do, and I appreciate your remarks and your participation in the process. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Owens. Ma'am. This is a difficult case. Um, you know, you, you've heard how you've impacted Mr. Sponsel's life. And I've heard you say, I'm sorry. Uh, I am concerned about the, the victim's uh, awareness that you hadn't been able to complete it because I'm not so sure you understand the impact you've had on his life for the last 23 years and that, that he will continue to live with for the rest of his life. Um, you've said all the right things. I know you've said things that people have told you we wanna hear about, I take full responsibility for my actions. I'm sorry and all that, we hear that every day. Um, 
I'm concerned about the fighting, uh, your history of fighting. Uh, to me, that's not good decision makings. I think they're, I, you know, I understand what prison life is like. I think I do, some. I'm, I kind of grew up in it, around it. But I, I, uh, I do think that there's opportunity for better decision making. I'm going to tell you, um, and there's opposition in the record from law enforcement because of the, the nature of the crime and the fact that you had a prior firearm uh, uh, violation, I guess. I'm willing to take a chance on you because of the parole project is willing to take a chance on you. But so I would vote to grant parole, but only after you finish that victims awareness program, whenever that program comes back online. And uh, I would like to see you prior to release do the Cage of Rage once again. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I would. And that you would not return to uh, Caddo Parish. Yes, That's my vote. I'm just one of three. Good luck to you. All right, Miss uh, Jackson. <clears throat> So as I'm going to be honest with you, uh, I am on the fence uh, right now. Uh, Mr. Sponsor, um, I am so sorry about the harm that's been done to you and how you continue to suffer. And I appreciate seeing you and hearing you. Um, and that certainly helps us as we make our decisions. Um, you know, it bothers me that as late as 2020, you were involved in a fight. And you have a history of being involved in fights. You know, it, it, you, you've had 23 total write-ups, which I guess is about the mid-range of what we get. But, you know, there are some people who have been incarcerated longer than you, who've had 10 or less write-ups and they're not for fighting. And you talk about, well, what it's like to be in there. Well, yeah, I know. Everybody, you know, faces those same pressures, but some people manage to make better decisions and to not involve themselves in situations where they, you know, get put in, you know, isolation and those kinds of things for fighting. And that concerns me. It really does. At your age, you should have outgrown some of this behavior. You know, you've done some good things. Um, you've made some strides. But today, I don't know. I, I respect my colleagues. I, I think they have, um, you know, a lot of experience and insight. Uh, but I'm, okay. I'm just not comfortable right now. Uh, I would like to see you go a little longer and demonstrate that you can handle, you know, you can take courses all you want, but unless you put the things that you learn in practice, then you're just a body in the room. And you didn't, apparently didn't put a lot into practice from your anger management courses. So today I'm, I'm going to vote to deny. I would like to see you go a longer period of time without any write-ups, and particularly not any write-ups um, for fighting. And, you know, I, I don't want you to be discouraged by my vote, because again, I'm just one vote, but I, I want you to use it as an opportunity to work harder. Um, because if you don't get a handle on that anger issue and your response to pressure, then you gotta come back. And, and we don't want to let you out just to have you come back. So I wish you the best, but today my vote is going to be to deny. But you have one vote to grant and one vote to deny. I've listened uh, to everything that was said there. I've been over your file. You know, I am concerned as well. I listen to what you're saying. I, you know, um, the fighting is a problem for me. I, I'm, I, I think you really need to get really involved in that victim awareness and have a better understanding. Uh, of that uh so for me today i would vote to deny your parole as well i think you you know i think if you stay out of trouble you do right you come back next time to apply make sure you have the victim awareness make sure you have your anger management again maybe it'd be different but uh 
I'm just not ready to take a chance today. So today my vote is denied. Two votes to deny, one to grant. Today your pro's been denied. Good luck to you. Well, thank goodness for Miss Jackson, right? I don't know what Miss Renato was thinking, frankly. It's like he doesn't have a good record. He doesn't, he's gotten into fights right up just to the prior year and a bad interview. I mean, you could tell he was just like he had scripted things, even to the point where Miss Renata initially asked him, How did you feel about spending half of your life in prison? And he says, Yes, I've thought about my actions a lot or something. Like he, he, went, he went, I mean, you just didn't see anything there. And then, you know, we see our our survivor, and we hear now that that it took him 20 years to learn how to walk again. He's only been walking since this happened for a couple of years, maybe three years. Think about that. And then I just want to emphasize how important it is for an ADA to show up on this case. He shows up alone. He shows up with no support yet. And, and his, his um, statement could have easily been, misinterpreted i think because the last words that he said was i can only love him but we know that that's not that he does not want him to get released it's just that he's so distraught You know, he said in the last hearing too, I forgot to mention it, you know, how I forgive him. And and you see Miss Jackson, when he she heard that, she actually like, she began to glow. Like she's paying attention. She That means it meant a lot to her. It touched her. I don't know if you see what the other, right? But. Yeah, I, I think, he, I don't know if he needed a unanimous vote. So I think it could have been pretty, it could have definitely gone his way. And that's kind of scary to think. But only a year later, well, two years, let's see. So this is October 2023. And the hearing we just saw was in was in January 2022, almost February. So it's like a year and, a, and change later, he's going to have another hearing. So we're not going to see all three defendants. What we're seeing is Clifford again. Um, now, I know Ms. Renatza mentioned what uh, that she's been in the system for a long time. I don't, it, I almost wonder if like her father was a warden or something, but just a quick overview. She, she has been around a long time. So she retired from the Department of Safety and Corrections in 2011 after serving 30 years. She served in a variety of management positions through the department with her last position being Deputy, Sec Deputy Secretary. She was the first female in Louisiana to achieve a designation certified corrections executive by the American Correctional Association and is a member of several correctional affiliation, affiliated organizations. She was appointed as chairman of the Louisiana Board of Paroles in February 2012 and chairman of pardon of the boards in August 2012. And she was reappointed by the governor. So, yeah, she's she's been around a long time. She understands the system better than anybody. And they don't do this job for money. She's making less than 50K a year, I believe the number is. It's uh, She could probably sit on the board of any type of law firm or publicly traded company servicing prisons in Louisiana, which is a huge industry and it's, and, um, and make a lot of money. And she's, as far as I know, not doing any of those things. She's doing this because she's wants to make a difference. So, I mean, you got to give her credit where it's due in my opinion there, but um, hang on one second. But we have, we do now know who it is that shot him twice in the back. And I'm guessing the one who shot him in the head was not the one that we saw earlier, uh, Jamitric. I'm guessing the one that shot, shot him in the head was when he got uh, a life plus 70 years. Um, So we'll go watch the next parole hearing. And then when this is done, we'll go over the rest of the 
of the documents uh, of the case file. It is it is quite interesting. Um, but I was I do want to make a note. I was reading through the documents while watching the parole hearing, and it says that they were wearing masks. So I was wrong. They were wearing masks, and they were covering their fingers, so their hands with gloves. So you know, I just want to put that out there on the record. Now, who we have here is um, the attorney, I forget his name, with the Parole Project. We have Andrew Hunley with the Parole Project. We have the student attorney in the middle, um, and we have our survivor um, and a, another supporter. And again, what do you realize? What do you see is missing here? We're missing a supporter for the survivor. There's no ADA, there's nothing, and that's just a broken system. We're stuck with, uh, you know, Miss Wise, which I don't expect to dive into his acts. Mr. Kelsey, I don't expect to dive into it. And Mr. Roche, he might dive into it. He's, you know, it's it's either Miss Jackson or Mr. Kelsey and, and, and Mr. Mirabella too, but mostly if you're using substances. But let's go jump in. He has helped Mr. Owens prepare for today's hearing, help prepare. Whoops, am I... Uh... Okay. Great, thank you. Clifford Owens, DOC number 334527. You are a second class offender, pro eligibility date 8 1 2021, good time 2 14 2056, full term 2 8 2057, a 60 year sentence. Uh, armed robbery, attempted second degree murder. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. All right, would you answer, Ms. Wise? Good morning, Mr. Owens. Good morning, ma'am. How's it going? Going all right. Good, good. This is your second hearing. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I saw on the record where you appeared on 125.22. You got two votes to deny. I'm sure you remember Mr. Kelsey and one vote to grant last time. All right. Uh, what have you been doing since? Wait, first of all, how much education do you have? Well, ma'am, I stopped in the ninth grade. Yes. Okay. Did any other education since then? I've been in school, ma'am. I'm I rolling in school. I'm in school, currently in school right now. Okay. Which? Okay. How's it going? Going all right. I'm. I'm you I'm have. Still, I'm still, well. Do you have any idea when they're gonna send you for testing? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I mean, I think I should be coming up for taste testing coming up pretty soon. Okay. Okay. Uh. How old are you today? 48, ma'am. And how long have you been in jail on this sentence, on this charge? 47 years, ma'am. 46, 46, I think 46 years, ma'am. You can't be 48 and been in jail 46 years. No, 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 my bad. Um, <laughs> okay, 26, okay. 26, ma'am, 26, my bad. Okay, okay, you, uh, you've been in jail for 26 years since, uh, yes, well, a little bit before 12, 16, or 99. Now, if I look at the records, it looked like you uh you were on supervision. You got released in 1997, and then you were sentenced on this charge in 1999. Uh, before that, your supervision, you were sentenced in '94, and you you, you were sentenced one five ninety four, and you got revoked three one of ninety five. Uh, so what's going to be different this time if you allowed to to be released with your supervision? What's going to be different this time? Well, ma'am, um, I have done time in Lake Providence. I hadn't seen what I've seen now in Angola and went through what I went through. Um, um, I learned a lot since I've been in prison. I learned how to make poor choices, um, um, do the right thing. Um, I got married. Um, I'm going to work for what I want. I ain't going to do nothing stupid. Um, you know, um, be a man, do the things I have to do once I get out. <laughs> I like that. I like. I like what I'm hearing. So, so uh, in your record, tell me about your release plan because I saw somewhere. Just tell me about your release plan. I plan on going to the pro project, and they're gonna help me find a job once I get there. My residence goes to the pro project. So your wife is in Louisiana now. No, she's in California. She's in California. And I read somewhere that she was gonna be moving to Louisiana. That's why I was asking. Yes, ma'am. She's gonna come down here once I get released. Yeah, she's gonna come to Louisiana. She's gonna okay. come back. Okay, that's the, that's the plan. Okay. Uh, I want you to know for the record, all law enforcement is opposed to your early release. There's nothing you can do about that. 
but uh, we get their opinions about early release and, and they are they're now in agreement. And you do have some uh, victim opposition to your early release because uh, your victim is still physically impacted, uh, wheelchair bound uh, because of your offense. And I just want to state that for the record. There's nothing you can do about that, but I just want to state it for the record. Uh, let's talk about your write-ups for a minute. Uh, you've had 10 fights since you've been incarcerated in these 26 years. And, and your, I think your last fight, I think, was, was a factor in, in why you were denied last time. So tell me, what have you done differently to stay out of fights that you weren't doing before? Well, I took anger management over again, and I mm -hmm. learned not to let my emotions cause me to react. I learned to think before I react, move myself around the situation. So you telling me you telling me that it actually works, huh? If you just remove yes, the situation, you can avoid fights. Yes, ma'am. Okay, now we tell this. It's not that we'd be expecting that from other guys. Don't, don't forget about the thinking don't process. Think huh? Say what now? Could you say it again? I can't hear you, ma'am. I, I couldn't hear you either. What you were saying about fighting now, what were you saying? Well, when I see a situation, I think I move myself around it. I mean, I don't respond to it. I, I mean, I use my anger management, cage my rage. Hey, hey. Well, we need, you need to do a commercial for us. You need to do a commercial for that program. Uh, and you do have a good institutional record. We don't see that very often. All the staff posts. You know, spoke well of you, and they—that's uh, important to me. I look at uh, the institutional record, and it, it says you work in the incinerator. Is, is that correct? What do you do there? That's, that's um, I collect trash, process. I'm on the garbage truck. I'm gonna hop on back of the garbage truck. Oh, I ride okay. around the farm picking up trash. Okay, okay. Now, uh, let's talk about the crime for a minute. Uh, do you do you uh, remember what was the motivation for that crime? Do you remember? Ma'am, I um, retrieved a firearm, and me and my co-defendants, I mean, I knocked on Mr. Sponsor's door. I, 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 I gained full control of the house once I went inside. I robbed Mr. Sponsor, and a tussle broke out, ma'am. A tussle had broke out while we was in there. Mr. Sponsor tried to leave outside the apartment. I shot him in the back, and um, while he was exiting, and my co-defendant shot him in the head. Doing the robbery. Right. Uh, uh, that matches up with what the uh, what the police report says. I guess my question is: that, that Were y'all under the impression that he had like four or five thousand dollars in the house? What was the motivation for picking him to rob? Well, we came in there to get some marijuana, man. We came in there for marijuana to get oh, um, that. yeah, marijuana. Y'all there to purchase marijuana from him? Yeah, and it turned into a robbery. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. I don't know. It was something that it was, that's what I wasn't clear on on the motivation for the crime. Yeah. So you've taken victim awareness. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And your last, you had your last two write-ups was in 2017 and 2020. Um, uh, do you plan on working towards your, your high school diploma? Is that something you plan on yes, doing? Your high school diploma. Do you have any children? Yes, ma'am. How many children? No, do you have? I don't have any children, ma'am. Okay, I didn't see it in the record. Okay. You didn't have insurance. Well, that's all I got. Let me see what the warden's got to say. Yes, ma'am. You know, uh, he, we, he was speaking of his last write up in 20, um, that knocked him back down to a, to a max it's custody. Uh, he's since been able to move himself back up, back to his class A trustee, working at the incinerator, uh, regained his uh, his men A in uh, September of 21, and from that time forward has, hasn't looked back. So doing what he's supposed to be doing. All right. Thank you, Warren. I appreciate that. All right. All right. We'll hear from Mr. Andrew Hunley now. Andrew Hunley with Louisiana Parole Project today, here to commit to the board. Uh, that if Clifford is granted parole, he will join our residential reentry program uh, where he will have access to our reentry programming, uh, where we will work to equip him with the skills he needs to uh, reintegrate into society after doing such a long prison sentence. We'll work with him on technological skills, social skills, uh, working to understand social norms, 
uh, as well as getting him employed, getting him um, transportation to employment, doctor's appointments, visits to his parole officer, uh, and working with him uh, so he can achieve self-sufficiency. Uh, we commit to provide housing for him until a point uh, he and his wife can have a, a, a safe and approved residence together. Uh, our organization is impressed with the work he's done over the last several years to get himself back to uh, where he's at in prison today. And we feel based on his age and maturity, uh, he's at the sweet spot where he can come home, have a career, uh, and make an impact in his community. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're here for Ms. Chiquita Owens. You're on mute, mute. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah, I wrote down a few things. I'm kind of nervous, but anyway, my name is Chiquita Owens and I live in Stockton, California and Clifford is my husband. And I currently work in the healthcare industry. I grew up knowing Mr. Owens during his childhood when he lived in California. At the time we resided next door to each other. Over the years, we were childhood friends. Over the past several years, I had an opportunity to visit with Mr. Owens and see his remarkable change. During our interactions, we engaged in conversations about different faucets of family, of my family and his accomplishments. The classes he currently participating in are completed in his faith. Mr. Owens has taken a course called Inside Out Dad, which is a parenting class, which provides a framework and practical application and development of self-awareness, handling his emotions and spirituality, and most of all, parenting. And I'm gratefully appreciated that Clifford had took this class as it offered him, that was offered to him by the DOC, and it has given him the tools necessary to, necessary to, re, to um, build a relationship with my family and my grandchildren. Since Mr. Owens' time of incarceration, he has undergone an incredible change. Clifford was, a very, was very troubled as a child, but watching his growth has been remarkable, has been a remarkable transition. He has been able to conquer his anger problems, which led to his incarceration. Meanwhile, build a productive work routine, allowing him to find meaning. With experienced welding, he has obtained a trade that he can utilize if given a second chance to re-entry to, re to society. I admire Mr. Owens' growth, his faith, and his ability to reform, and his deep understanding of the impact of his offense. Moreover, Mr. Owens will be assisted by his, um, upon his release by myself and my family, who will provide a financial, who will provide financial support, encouragement, and other assistance necessary to ensure successful transition back into society. In closing, I humbly ask that you allow Clifford Owens to serve the remainder of his sentence in the community where he can work and be a part of a family. All right. Respectfully, thank you. Thank you, thank you. We're here for Mr. John Sponsel now. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's a big step that I'm that I'm willing to take. I'm willing to give Mr. Owens a chance with life. If he can learn from what he done like I had to learn. I'm not going to hate myself for the decision, but it's an opportunity. If he could show me remorse in some way that he could help a person like me, maybe that We'll give him his freedom. On this day, I'm willing to let go.
Mr. Owens, if you can hear me, understand it takes a real man to make a decision in life. With my choice, I want you to show me that you can become a better man. Prove to yourself more than to me that you've learned from your decision or your mistakes. I have. I know you don't hear this every day, but if you guys understand like I understand, I'm willing to give them a chance. All right, sir. Thank you so much. It takes a lot. That takes a lot. God bless you. That takes a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Mr. Clifford, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yeah. Um, I apologize to Mr. Sponsor for what I've done to him and everybody I impacted by my actions. And um, I realized I took him through a lot. I caused him to, um, to have post-traumatic stress disorder. I caused him not to mingle with other people because of my actions. I was dead wrong. And I apologize. And if y'all give me a second chance at life, I'm going to work. I'm going to take care of my family, my wife. I love her. I'm going to do the right thing. Bye. I didn't do the same thing to, to put me in the situation that I'm in now. I'm a bigger person. This place has changed me a lot. I learned my lesson. I ain't going to hurt nobody else's family members. All right. Thank you. All right, Clifford. Thank you so much. Um, Patrick, you want to make a brief statement, wrap it up? Yes, sir, Mr. Kelty. Uh, thank you, honorable members of the committee. Certainly, uh, Mr. Owens is his own best advocate. Um, I, I would be remiss uh, not to note that um, that Mr. Owens has is deeply remorseful and in our conversations understands the impact of his offense. And um, for the reasons that Mr. Owens stated, uh, I respectfully request that this board, uh, for the foregoing reasons, give him a favorable grant of parole uh, to allow him to continue working on the outside as a taxpaying citizen and a member of a productive family. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Panel prepared to vote? Yes. Yeah. Yes, why? Uh, Mr. Owens, you've been given a gift today from your victim. A lot of guys don't get that. And I, and I, I really want to commend him for for his statements today, for his reflections, and for for that release, uh, we can all feel it in the room. Uh, I'm inclined to take a chance on you as well, Miss Owens. My vote is to grant. You do have a low tiger score. You have positive comments from the warden. And you have an excellent transition plan, better than most anybody is. Uh, I would like for you to stay long term with the mm -hmm. Santa Parole Project. Take your time. Uh, one year after release, start doing community service five hours a month. And one year after release, enrolled in couples counseling. And when couples counseling means I can't order your wife to go, but even if she doesn't go, you go. It's a whole new role being a spouse. There's a lot of stuff you don't know. And, and I, the couples counseling, you know, y'all figured it out, but stay in counseling to work on being a husband. Uh, that is my vote. Best wishes to you. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First of all, I'd like to speak to the victim. As the victim's advocate, I do appreciate the statement that was just made by the victim. You don't see that very often. Matter of fact, it's very rare that a victim is willing to give his offender another chance, a second chance on life. And you should appreciate the statement. Um, Mr. Owens, and you should uh, remember it for the rest of your life. Based upon positive remarks from the warden, good programs, a good transition plan with the Louisiana Parole Project, uh, and you have no disciplinary issues since your last hearing, my vote is to grant yes, your release under the same conditions as Mrs. Watts. I actually have two votes to uh, 
Grant your prayer. I, I actually denied your prayer last time you're here. We ask you not to get any, have any disciplinary write ups, you know, from here to your next hearing. We ask you to do victim awareness. You did both of those. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I'm terribly impressed as well with the work you've done. I'm, I'm just in awe of what the victim said. And uh, again, want to thank him so much. That, that, that means a lot to us here. But you've done the work you need to do. And so my vote is to grant your parole today. Uh, you'll you'll have community service five hours per month. You have a curfew from 10p to 6a. You'll continue to work on your GED. I think that's important. You need to work on your GED and get that. That'll be good for you. And then uh, after you finish with the parole project, you'll I guess you'll go to California with your wife. If she's in California right now, is that correct? Yes, sir. That, she's in California. Your plans are to go be with her, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Sounds great. Three votes to grant. Today, your pro's been granted. Good luck to you. All right. Thank you all. Wow. Not a, not a dry eye in the house, I feel. I, I felt it. I was connected to that moment. And I mean, it even brought Kelsey to the moment. It, I felt like everyone was drawn in from across all the, the states and places where they were from that Zoom call, which is a difficult thing to make happen. But the the words of, of that survivor, what he had said, was so powerful. I was, uh, I wanted to have an episode to run. Um for for christmas christmas eve and i i didn't you know i wanted something to be more different than usual something that can maybe connect to the holiday and this is gonna be it this is it uh you know they they didn't even i thought kelsey was gonna say to, don't talk to, to the victim. Talk to us. But, uh, you know, it, it even pulled everyone paid attention. Miss Wise was not on her phone. Um, I mean, it was. It's uh, it just shows the power of. When someone is ready to forgive and to give that chance and for everyone to connect to that. I don't think I'd ever be able to to forgive but you do see, I saw the power right there. And I'm happy to let you know that he is still out. He has not gotten back in trouble. Of course, the terrible um, thought if he were to do something wrong, it would be unimaginable. Um, it's just hard to describe, but we don't need to go to that morbid thought. He's He's only 48 years old. He's got his whole life ahead of him, a lot of it left. So he got a blessing. He really did. You know, he gave him two bullets in the back. And in return, he gets he gets a gift. Um, The way the the hearing ended, I thought it went quite well. Once once the once you know the survivor spoke, John spoke. I I, I didn't want to hear this you know um, attorney in training give this whole speech and then have to hear uh, uh, also the Clifford maybe you know give a whole speech, but they didn't. The attorney in training gave the perfect ending short and to the point it was all that was necessary and i don't know if he improved that short statement or if it was initially written out to be short if he improved it i will give him a huge high five because that takes to read the room and to play it right that's impressive because nothing nothing more was needed than what he said and and same to the to you know to clifford he did a decent job he said you know he he sounded remorseful and he also stated two important things they could have added the third thing about not being able to walk but he added the, the the idea of the ptsd and it shows that he listened from the first hearing and that he and the thing that he hasn't been able to have i think he said friends and 
it wasn't just like a memorized speech. I wish it didn't happen type of thing, right? I almost don't want to read the rest of the... Uh, Of the crime just because i kind of want to leave on this note of positivity but i think that some of you might want what might want to know so and i did commit to doing it so for those of you who are in a good moment i would uh encourage you to end it here and for those of you who still can think they can be in a good moment and and read this with me then you hang in there but i don't want to ruin this so but this is what happened yeah i guess you can also look at it as the facts of the case here so and then you might ask well when's the next hearing for the first person who we've covered who really you know and on that note there were, there were three involved in this crime, one who, who does not have parole eligibility, and then the first person we saw, Jimitric, and you could see how he did nothing to better himself. So there is something that um, I think we've seen here is that maybe people can find path to redemption while Jimitric put no effort to find that path to redemption with the blessing of the survivor, right? I'm not, if the survivor did not want them to be redeemed, I would say no. And I think Mr. Roche would have said no too. So Shreveport police, so you remember what happened, right? Um, he was shot in the head and he was on, uh, I was unable to identify a trial with the defendant was shot. The defendant fled the apartment complex in his blue Ford Blue Escort. Now his neighbor heard popping sounds and then someone crying for help. He opened his door to discover Sponsel on the ground lying partially out of his apartment. Sponsel said that he had been robbed and shot. So uh, his neighbor called 911 and then he was eventually transported to LSU Medical. Now the investigation. So... Shreveport police officer Blackman and Miller were among the first officers to arrive at the shooting scene. Sponsel was found on his back on the doorway, uh, in the doorway with his head outside and his feet inside. Miller reported to um, a, a, a later arriving detective that he was told by Sponsel that the three black males who had entered the apartment were wearing masks. Blackman also reported to the detective that he was told by EMTs that Sponsel told them he was not shot while going into his apartment. Detective Ronnie um, told him that he was shot, sorry, while going into his apartment. Detective Ronnie Grider of SPD's homicide robbery unit investigated the shooting. He described Sponsel's apartment and ransacked. Grider noticed where a bullet had ricocheted from the wall and a breezeway outside of Sponsel's apartment and up into the breezeway ceiling. He thought the bullet had been fired from the apartment. Ryder went to LSUMC within within 90 minutes of the shooting in an attempted in an attempt to interview Sponsel, but was told by the hospital personnel that he could not speak to Sponsel at that time. Ryder returned um, on January 29th, a little over four hours after the shooting. So four hours after the shooting, he's somehow conscious. Remember, he got hit in the head as well. Sponsel told Ryder that he was shot from behind as he approached the front door in an effort to escape and then was shot in the head as the defendant left. Sponsel also told Greider that one person shot him and that he was first shot while in the kitchen. Greider did not find blood or shell casings inside Sponsel's apartment. Sponsel was able to give a description of only one of the suspects. Detective Caroline Eves is an investigator of the SPSD homicide and robbery unit. Um, and at 11.40 p.m. on the night of the shooting, Eves received a report of Sponsel's Ford Escort had been found burning. The chrome rims, tires, wheels, and stereo had been removed. Okay. Ford Escort for you. They, they really went. Marlon Hanna, a friend of the three defendants, lived a short distance away from the vehicle, was found. SPD officer Danny Duddy was assigned to the crime scene investigation unit, and he found blood on the ground 
and on a wall in front of Sponsel's apartment. He did not find any blood inside the apartment. Duddy lifted some partial fingerprints from inside the door frame, but these prints were unidentifiable. He agreed on the stands that wearing socks over hands would prevent fingerprints from being left. Detective Cedric Wilson, an investigator with the SPD, received a phone call from an anonymous caller on January 29th. The caller said that Cedric and individuals with names uh, Kiki and Meme, or Meme, I don't know if Meme was a word back then, right? Were involved in sponsor shooting. Wilson checked. Ugh, look at that. Uh, isn't that interesting? An anonymous caller is what turned them in. Wilson checked the alias files and came up with the names. I mean, without the anonymous caller, they probably um, never get them. Three photographic lineups were prepared and brought to Sponsor on the evening of January 30th. Sponsor was in ICU at the time. Sponsor, who was lying on his back and was unable to sit up, turn his head, or hold the lineups. <laughs> It's just such a tragedy, too. Here's this man in his prime, a beast, you know, an offensive lineman for semi-pro teams. Who knows where his future would go? I mean, you, you hear stories of people in semi-pro who get called up for any given reason. And then to be to have to learn how to walk and for him to have the grace to forgive this man. Each lineup, which contained six photos, was held by guiders direct above Sponsel's face. Sponsel picked Dimitri Dubow out of the first lineup. Grider remembered Sponsel saying that uh, Dimitri Dubow was one who shot him in the head. Remember, Wilson recalled Sponsel saying Dimitri Dubow was the person who held the 25 to his head when he opened the door. The gunman had pulled the trigger at the point, but the gun was not fired. Sponsel could not identify anyone in the second lineup, which contained Jerry Wilson's photo. When shown in the third lineup, Sponsel picked out Clifford Owens' photo. I guess Jerry's the one who shot him in the head. Grider recalled that Sponsel responded to Clifford Owens was the one who shot him in the back. Wilson testified that Sponsel and Clifford Owens shot him in the back while he was trying to get away. Because Sponsel was unable to sign the rear of the photos, Wilson signed on his behalf with his permission. Arrest warrants of Clifford Owens and Nabarro weren't um warrant were served in frederick street on the morning of february 1st 1997 spt spd detectives gathered the evidence and filled out the search warrant returned detective wilson found um debro asleep in the bedroom in the northeast corner of the house when nilson and and lakeith debro if he had a nickname he said his nickname was kiki wilson and sorrel searched Dimitri's bedroom the Jamitric de Brau's bedroom, which was in southeast corner of the house. In this room, they found a small black Titan 20 semi 25 semi automatic pistol inside a stereo speaker, an RG short barrel 20, 20, uh, 22 pistol, and under a pile of clothes, and a new Frontier Western style 2022 20, 22 pistol. Sorry. You know, that's what it is. He was lucky. He was, you know, he survived. I forget about that. He was shot with a 22. And uh, I'm sure many of you know, but the 22 is, I think, the smallest caliber you get. It's real small. And that's probably why he survived. He was a big guy, two in the back. How you survive in the head, though, I don't know. You know, I I've read that they say 22s are a favorite among like professional hitmen. Um, because they're quieter and the 22 from a close range can have a lethal effect because the round tumbles versus going through. And uh, so it doesn't have the exit. It doesn't exit and it can cause problems that way. Again, I'm not, you know, I'm sure there are many of you watching that know this and can put it in the comment section and correct me. But anyway, to so get hit in the head with anything and survive requires a Tremendous amount of luck or, or God, what you want to believe in. Also discovered in the room were Dimitri's ID card and several Polaroid photos showing Clifford's, um, well, showing them all together. SPD officer Anthony Adams searched Lakeith's bedroom. He discovered a long barrel Ruger 22 pistol and RG38 in the headboard of a bed. You know, they got all these guns. <laughs> 
Man, both guns were black with brown handles. Officer Duddy was unable to re recover any usable fingerprints on the firearm, seized at future Fedrick's home. No evidence was recovered at the apartment of Clifford Owen's sister, where Owens occasionally stayed. None of the items taken from inside the sponsor's apartment were recovered. On February 5th, Owens, wishing to turn himself in, called Wilson from Oakland, California the next day um, and flew to Oakland to extradite Owens, who surrendered there. Oh, there we go. So, you know, we just heard that he grew up in California, and I wonder what he was doing in Louisiana this time, but he turned himself in from California, huh? Wow. I wonder what would motivate anyone to turn himself in. I guess you just hope or think you're not going to get such a long sentence, but if he knew that he was going to spend the next 25 years or so in prison, he might have taken uh, every day of freedom that he could. Who knows what strategy he had. But it doesn't seem the judge gave him any benefit. He gave him, you know, wasn't like he got a more lenient sentence. No, he shot him twice in the back. You're, you're. Um, here's a doctor from the neurosurgeon that treated him. Uh, he said that uh, the effects of his gunshot wounds, two bullets have penetrated his nervous system. One bullet entered the left temporal lobe of the brain. Oh, wow before fragmenting, resulting in damage to the bones and brain at the base of the skull. Wow. How he was able to talk to the detective just a few hours later is incredible. This man is made out of something else. A second bullet entered the body in the mid-back and damage the spinal cord and fifth uh, thoracic level at a fifth thoracic level. I know you nurses and doctors will let me know what that means. Sponsor was unable to move his legs as well at first because the bullet fragment stayed in the body. Dr. Pollen opined that the weapons used were low caliber. Dr. Pollen reviewed uh, Sponsil's record when he was admitted to LSUMC after the shooting. Sponsil's drug screens upon admission were, was negative for alcohol and narcotics. Sponsil was prescribed Percocet as a pain medication. Remember, he was an offensive um, lineman. Uh, but, you know, they said there, I wonder if, you know, I wonder if he actually was a dealer or if the guy... It was misidentity or if they made it up. Dr. Pollen described Percocet as a low potency narcotic that does not cause mental disorientation or confusion. Sponsors. Um, I, it's not clear to me if it was on Percocet at the time they reviewed it or at the time or because he was recovering, he was on that. I think it was because he was recovering, so he wasn't even, I don't know. Sponsor's orientation at the time was placed was regularly tested while at LSU MC, and he was questioned about his personal information. The sponsor was discharged to rehabilitation in February of 1998. Spinal fluid began leaking from his nose. Oh, my God. A cranial procedure was performed. However, it was unsuccessful. The procedure was repeated. The sponsor continued to suffer from double vision in his right eye. Dr. Pollen also testified that difficulty with concentration and patchy memory are typical result of injury to left temporal lobe. I'm trying to remember the love and peace that we left with. Um, each defendant argues that there was insufficient evidence to support his conviction for the armed robbery and attempted second degree. The motions were post verdict judgment, was, but the acquittal was denied. So when the defendant challenged both sufficiency and evidence of the trial errors, um, and you know, the, right, the main contestants say, how would you know who shot him? Like, how would you actually take his word for it if they didn't have any of the uh, defendants testify against each other? And even if they did, how reliable would that be? But um, 
Detective Guy to recall that the sponsor said that Dimitri was the one who shot him in the head. Detective Wilson remembered it differently, recalling that sponsor said Dimitri held a gun to his head when he opened the door. We know that sponsor testified that a gun was placed his head when he first opened the door and the trigger was pulled, but the gun jammed. Upon picking up Clifford's photo, sponsor told the officers that Clifford Owens was one shot and shot him in the back and when shown in the fourth lineup several days later, Sponsel immediately pointed to, to Bro's photo. There was a person who shot him. Sponsel had earlier told police that one person shot him. Doctor basically testifies that the damage to his brain could have, you know, obviously caused him to missay things. You know, they, they basically go through. Now, I mean, it's a fair question. How would you actually, how can you expect him to really know? But at the same time, if thing, everything slowed down for him, then he would never forget. I mean, he did say, he did speak about hearing it and seeing him in his dreams. So I don't doubt him for a second and no one's doubting him. But it is it is worth bringing up in a jury trial. Um, emphasis added, we cannot conclude that the probative value of these two photographs is outweighed by any uh, prejudicial effective highlighted defense counsel photographs into evidence. Okay, so that's going to be it. I'll put the links in the description. There are more documents and appeals that Richard shared, but I think we, I think the moral of the story here and what we've seen is the grace of the survivor and you know there was his life should have been taken right when he opened the door to when he when he did what what a football star would do and plow through those men and almost escape but two to the back one to the head and to survive and all these years later after learning to walk again and being able to get up here and forgive him and wish him well. And now, Mr. Clifford, it is your job to live your best life for him, in my opinion. And I learned a lot, I would say, from John. And I think it's a great message to send to, send to the world. And wish you all a Merry Christmas. With that, I'll let you go.